This is Supported Sexy, Episode 93, with Evita Robinson, founder of Nomadness Travel Tribe. Welcome to the Support is Sexy podcast. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, producer, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I talk to women entrepreneurs who share their journeys and the true stories of their wins and their lessons and give you insight and inspiration to take your business and your life to the next level. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I'm so excited to have you here. You know, it just would not be the same without you. So today we are welcoming Evita Robinson. And Evita is the founder of Nomadness Travel Tribe, which you probably heard of. If not, look it up for sure. It is an incredible group of world travelers that have come together under this community that Evita has created. She started it five years ago with about 100 people. It has grown today to include more than 15,000 members, and they've traveled to as many as 30 destinations around the world. So an incredible group, powerful community. We talked to Evita about that, about building this community, but I'm also so appreciative of her because she shared a lot also about her personal journey, not just her entrepreneurial journey, and the importance of self-care, mental health, wellness, and for someone like her who has such a large platform, the importance of sharing her own experience in that space with mental health, anxiety, and all of those things. So thank you, Evita, for sharing all of that so openly. We really appreciate it. And some of the other things that you'll hear from Evita are why you have to be a little delusional, which I agree, to be an entrepreneur. Also getting comfortable making business decisions that might piss your people off. Shutting out the white noise and making self-care a sacred priority. How to maintain your sanity as an entrepreneur. And also the importance of lifting the taboo of discussing mental health, especially in the public space, as we just mentioned. Why writing in a journal for Evita is the cheapest form of therapy. And I agree. I've had a journal since I was 16. Also, why she shuts down the idea that she's fearless and the dangers of scaring yourself into analysis paralysis. Evita says no matter what, with your dream, your idea, you have to get started. So I know you're going to enjoy this episode. Lots of great information. Be sure to go to supportissexypodcast.com, search Evita, and you'll go to her show notes page and see all the resources that she mentions in this episode, all the links, all the courses and the new things that she has going on. So be sure to go there, check her out, get more information. So without further ado, Evita Robinson. So, Evita, thank you so much for joining us for an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you. I appreciate it. Excellent. So the first question I ask everyone, when did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? It's so funny because entrepreneurship to me, I think, is kind of like a love and hate relationship that just like repeats itself over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Um but as far as falling in love with it, I think that's more into, I think that leads more into me falling in love with what I do than necessarily the up and down that comes along with entrepreneurship. Um, it's the people, it's the community that Nomadness has built, being able to create a, an essence of freedom. That's what I love the most about entrepreneurship. And I think that's probably the one quality that I have fallen head over heels in love with. So I think the moment that I realized that there was a sense of freedom and autonomy that I could create while also creating these experiences, you know, for, you know, tens of thousands of people around the world, the day that those fused together, um, probably the first trip that we've ever taken um, back in 2012 was one of the moments of like, OK, I'm, I'm on to something very specific and, and I can own this, I can run with this, you know, I was freelancing. So I knew what that lifestyle was like, even beforehand, the quote unquote, working for yourself while still kind of like pseudo working for other people. Mm -hmm. I was freelancing in television production before, before, and actually when I first started Nomadness. And so I knew for years and lived very unorthodox when it came to business before this. Um, but the full on jump um, and understanding what that freedom and autonomy could look like is probably the moment where I fell in love with it. 
Interesting. Now, what's the love hate part of it? Um, that sounds like a little bit of the love, but and I trust me, I relate. But for everyone listening, what do you feel like are, is the the up and down part of it of entrepreneurship? I mean, it's just, it's nuts. Like it's absolutely nuts. Entrepreneurship is not for everybody. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that that is a misconception. I think it's safer. And with the, you know, the economy and the way that we are, you're definitely ahead of the game. If you create something that you own, it could be supplemental. It doesn't have to be your tell all end all, um, the way a lot of people position it, but the actual being living every day, the hustle and grind and, just like almost like disillusionment that you have to put yourself in that things are going to work out even when it looks like things are crumbling. Everybody's not built for that. Right. You know, they're not, they're just not. And I actually think that some of the best, um, start off entrepreneurs are people who don't have much because they know what it's like to already be at the bottom. You know, for me, I started nomadis when I was on unemployment. So mm it's like, I don't have anything else to lose, you know? Right. <laughs> so, right. It, and, and as crazy as that sounds, there's a sense of freedom that even originates from starting in that position. You know, if you're going into it with all this money or all these backers and all these benchmarks that you have to hit, you're not starting in entrepreneurship with freedom. You actually have very concrete and tangible markers that need to get hit and, and it balls to the wall from the start. And so if it's just you and your idea, you have freedom to play, to manipulate, to, you know, even it out and and figure it out before you start bringing anybody else into the fold. And I think that that's something that's really important to, you know, to understand. But I mean, it, it's the days where you're broke as hell and you don't know where the money's coming from. You know, it's it's the up and down of, you know, thinking that there's things that are come going to come in. It's when you know, you're hell bent on partnerships and you plan things and then all of a sudden they fold at last minute, you mm -hmm. know, and you have to be creative and, you know, think on the spot. For me, I run an international community. It's the times where there may be something that I think is going to hit really hard within the group and it doesn't. And then I have to reroute, you know, or it's days where, you know, we're being praised for things that have happened from, you know, 15,000 plus people in the tribe. But then, my business is run, it's equal parts community and business. And sometimes I have to make business decisions that piss the community off, mm. you know? So now it's like, okay, all those people that love and support you and they trust you, you know, I, I really do firmly believe that. And I've worked for that trust over five years, you know, the, the tribe trust me, even when they don't understand me, they trust me. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm very grateful for that relationship that has been fostered over the last five years. But it's when I have to make those decisions that, you know, they're looking at me sideways and I'm just like, look, y'all don't have to run with this, but everybody's got an opinion and uh, their own vision of what your vision is. You know what I'm saying? So it's dealing with that. It's dealing with, you know, depending on your support system, listening to the white noise that pops up as far as, you know, friends, family, spouses, boyfriends, girlfriends, you know, next of kin that are just like, you're crazy. What are you doing? Or it'll never succeed. You have to be in such a space to be able to allow these things to ricochet off of you, you right. know, and not let them get you down so much. You know, you have to have a sense of discernment in which if there's a lesson there, you can pull the lesson out without internalizing all the pathology that may be associated with it because it's not yours to bear. Right. It's theirs. And so you got to just be it's 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 constantly being an emotional flux. Constantly, constantly. And I always say you have to surround yourself with people who appreciate your kind of crazy. Yeah, you absolutely <laughs> have to. And you and in some cases you have to learn. You have to learn what your crazy is because entrepreneurship is going to bring parts of your personality out that you never knew you had. Right. right. And, and that's real. And you're just going to be like, oh, shit, like, where did that come from? And you've got to just ride that wave, you know, and as you change and as your business changes, you know, those people may change, your team may change, and it's going to attract, you know, what it needs to go to the next level as long as you're putting the work in. So yeah, there's just so many, like entrepreneurship is a, is a highly, highly emotional investment that people make, 
highly emotional investment. It'll have you in therapy real quick. Exactly. I was just going to mention that after you finish, I was going to say that's the reason why I encourage and I know a lot of other uh, people encourage and entrepreneurs to have a therapist or someone that you can confide in in those moments where it is an emotional roller coaster. I always say before I started, I thought, oh, entrepreneurship is up and down a roller coaster day to day, week to week. But it's actually within the same day. Like you said, you could be high oh, yeah. thinking partnerships oh, yeah. are done. And then by the afternoon, everything is falling completely apart. And you're like, what part of the game is this? Exactly. Like- <laughs> what just happened? I don't even know who I am or what just happened right now. Yet you're still it keeping it going. Right. Right. And, and on the therapy, bit. So anybody who follows me on social media knows that I very I talk very openly about um, self-care and about having a therapist. I've been in some form of therapy since middle school. Mm. And so it's something like my therapist now, she was my counselor in college and I kept her, you know? Mm-hmm. So, you know, if anybody's got big bucks and wants like all the juicy stories, like, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> my therapist is the one to go to. She's been with me for about 15 years. Um, so, and why has that, that been important to you? Is it because of, I mean, it started earlier than when you were an entrepreneur, but just in general, knowing the importance of self-care sounds like from a very young age. Yeah. Well, I mean, self-care is kind of like a model that I've definitely adopted since becoming an entrepreneur. I'm sure I had it to some capacity, but it wasn't, um, it, it actually, I didn't, I didn't, to be honest with you. And what ended up happening on a personal note was I used to suffer from severe anxiety and panic attacks. And so I was a yes person, always an overachiever. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, even in school, this is nothing new. Like you have the poster child of like the recipe that you need to put together for a person who's eventually going to own their own business. Like I was that child. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of pressure. I didn't need outside pressure on me because I was already beating the hell out of myself, you know, and I was always very self-aware, very in tune, you know, the old soul, as they say it as a young child. And all of those components led into it. I was also the oldest child. So that level of responsibility was something that I took on at a very early age, you know, and it was really in, um, in college where a lot of these things start to kind of show themselves in college. Cause you're just, in, you're around people you ain't never been around before you're away mm-hmm. from home. You're in charge of your own schedule, school. It's like all the stuff comes out in your like late teens, early twenties. And so I ended up, it was sophomore going into junior year of college. I was rushed to the hospital for my first like panic attack. I thought I was going to die. Mm. I didn't know what was going on. And I was in the car with my mother and it was so crazy because <laughs> as soon as they told me that I didn't have to go into work that day, it was over the summer, my, my heart rate and my blood pressure went down and it was crazy. They were like, look at this. And at that point in time, anybody who knows me knows I'm a creative first before all this business stuff. And I was working at IBM at that time. And anybody who knows me is like, what? And it's like, exactly. You know, Mm -hmm. I was just in a place where I was really working in an environment that was against the grain for what I believe in, you know, and the position that I was in at that time, they were doing the best they could. I was an intern, an inroads intern. But at the same time, I was just like, yo, like this just isn't for me. They were trying to stick me in as creative a role as they could for the internship program, but it was still extremely corporate. You know, it just is what it is. Right. And, and I was having severe anxiety attacks to the point where I had reached a pinnacle where my body started to like revolt from what I was doing as well. Mm. You know, there were components, there were, you know, personal issues. Like I was having those, those conversations that, you know, when you live in a divorced home, you know, my father was getting that first conversation that, you know, they dread when your child gets older and starts like really checking you on certain things. Right. So I was dealing with all of these emotions at one time and it surfaced for years as really like severe anxiety and panic attacks and any symptom that you could think of, I had everything. Do you, and, did you have the symptoms and sorry to interrupt, but did you no. experience the symptoms, but as most of us um, sometimes do kept going anyway, uh, or maybe you didn't recognize what the symptoms were, but say, I know some of us suffer from headaches or feelings of stress or that, but we keep going and going and going until the body, like you said, is finally like, look, you've got to stop. Um, no. And the reason why is because my symptoms were so severe that they would stop me in my tracks. Okay. Like when my anxiety came on the game, it wasn't like, I'm going to lead you into this. And if you don't nip this in the bud, it's going to get worse. It was like, you've already pushed yourself to that point. So I'm going to just drop it all on you right now Mm. and get your attention and make sure you understand that this is not a game and you need to sit down. And so for me, when, by the time it showed up, I had already reached that pinnacle. 
And so I paid attention and mm-hmm. I don't play those games. So it was just like, and, and the symptoms were so scary, you know, feeling like I couldn't swallow, feeling like I couldn't breathe. I would get cold sweats. I would like get heart, heart palpitations were like the worst for me. I would feel dizzy. Like these are things that you can't, you can't hide this. You, you know what I'm saying? Right. So for me, I had no choice but to take stock. And then in talking with my family, I realized that I had like, it also ran in my family. So for me, it was like getting the help with that. Um, the Midwest Center for Anxiety and Depression. My mother was up one night late listening to like an infomercial. She bought their 16 week program for me and I did it while I was in college and it made such a big difference. I was really leaning in on, you know, my boyfriend at the time, my therapist at the time, um, who is still my therapist now, actually, as well as years later, when it started to kind of like come up again, I got a homeopath and that really changed the game for me because homeopathy is something that really breaks you down on like emotional, psychological, physical, all of these levels. And, you know, your first interview with a homeopath essentially is like a really long life, you know, recounting up until present moment therapy session, Mm -hmm. but they look for patterns, even in the way that you talk, the words that you use, the way that you describe things, and they will dig into these patterns and essentially give you a remedy that parallels what you're feeling and what you're going through. And that really changed the game for me. I think going with um, my homeopath was just like, whoa, okay, Mm -hmm. this is something that I'm really into. And it helped my symptoms a lot. And it really helped me eventually get it under control. I haven't had a full on panic attack in like, I can't even, I mean, it's probably going on a decade at this point. And I'm I'm well enough now to know that when symptoms come up, I know what my symptoms are. I also know what my triggers are. Mm -hmm. I know how many days I can go without getting enough sleep before my body starts freaking out, you know? And so I know these little like, you know, pink flag, orange flag symptoms where it's like, guess what? You're going to sit down today and you're going to relax and you're going to delegate today because we're not doing this with ourselves. And I actually think that going through anxiety was, that's what taught me self-care. And most importantly, that's what told me and taught me how to say no, Mm -hmm. just no excuse. You know, I hated disappointing people. Even to this day, I hate disappointing people. And so I felt like there always had to be an explanation or I would feel guilty. It's like, no is a complete sentence and no, I'm not doing it. I don't want to do it. I'm not doing it. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of the most powerful tools that I put in my arsenal going forward. And it gave me just a sense of discernment in how to deal with people. If I never went through what I went through with anxiety, there's no way in hell I'd be able to be as effective now in my life with as much as I do, you know, and be able to balance it all. You know, I had to go through that, uh, you know, earlier. I had to go through it in college and, you know, the end of high school to really be able to create and understand what my coping mechanisms were and what my actual triggers are to be able to know when to back off and when to dive in. So it's an ebb and flow. And I think that it's another reason why I talk so openly about it, because I don't know when it was like taboo to ask for help with us. I don't know when it was like, when it became taboo for us to talk about freely mental health and understanding that we're human beings with levels, you know, it's like, I can be fine 90% of the time, but if I have a day where I'm just like in the slums and I need to just relish in it for a minute and allow myself to feel what I need to feel, I shouldn't be considered weak, Right. you know, it shouldn't be seen as you know, something, well, you need to get it together. And another thing, and I piss people off when I say this, and I really, really, really don't care is people need to understand the difference between going to an actual licensed professional in this background that can help you with this versus just turning to your clergy or your best friends or your mother to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. These are not like health, mental health professionals. They're just not you know, you can talk to them, but if you're not coupling this up with somebody that can diagnose you, where if you do have a mental issue that you need to deal with, that may need to be dealt with by, you know, being able to write you a prescription for some type of medication, 
you're not talking to who you need to talk to. You right. need to supplement that with somebody who can actually do something if there are serious symptoms that pop up that you may actually need help with. Somebody, like you said, who can recognize patterns and all that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, recognize patterns and, and who can write you a prescription if you end up needing it. And that's mm-hmm. what I tell people. I'm like, that's the difference between going to your pastor and going to an actual licensed psycho, you know, psychologist or psychiatrist. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, you need to have somebody who studied this, who is licensed in this regard to be able to identify what it is that you may be going through, you know? And, and I just think the taboo behind mental health, particularly in the black community is bullshit. It it really is. And I'm, and I'm over it. So I use my platforms and influence. I talk very freely. You know, when I leave the therapist and I'm crying, I'll post it up as a Facebook status Mm. and I don't feel weak. And, you know, every time I'll get people that comment or message me privately, like, yo, you've empowered me so much, you know, you've, you've encouraged me to not feel like I'm less than because I have to, you know, ask for help because the truth of the matter is everybody's going through shit. I don't care who you are. And, and the more prominent I am and the more prominent the people that are in my network become what they don't understand is I'm having the same conversations with these people that are plastered all over, you know, the internet that I am with my girlfriends. You know, we're all going through the same thing. People feel like once you get on some, you know, a a level of success that you're almost inhumane at that point. Right. And that's not the way that this works. You know what I'm saying? It might even become intensified. Exactly. Right. (laughs) Say the same thing. Yep. It's even (laughs) intensified more. Yeah. You've got to be able to navigate because now it's like you're so accessible and everybody's got an opinion of you and who you are and what you're doing and how you're doing it. It's like you've got to be able to find spaces in which to block out the noise or else you're going to drive yourself crazy. Now, how do you handle that with being uh, more having a much higher public profile than in the beginning? Obviously, how do you manage that? Is it through your support network and all the people that you have surrounding you? Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. I well, I write. I am on my actually I haven't counted in a long time. So it may be more than this. I think the last time I checked, I was on my like 26th, 27th journal. Mm-hmm. I have my life since 10th grade on paper. Me so, too. I have so, them. Right. I just put them in store since 19. Well, I'll give away my age, but 1989. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just writing is a it's it's the cheapest form of therapy, mm-hmm. you know, and being a creative my creative space where I would flourish the most is actually through words. So it helps me kind of navigate through what I'm going through. Obviously, um, therapy absolutely is, is that as well. And as far as support system, you know, I have, especially being an entrepreneur with your family, it's kind of like, it doesn't make sense until it makes sense. Right. Until it makes money. Right. (laughs) And so it's just like, okay, for a while, even your normal support system for everyday things may be looking at you crazy. You know, and you've got to be able to keep going and, you know, navigate around that until they come around. Or if they don't, you just need to find another one. So like my family and tribe has become a huge newer support system for me and my endeavors. You know, even when I have family members that I'm just like, yo, are y'all ever going to get on the boat? You know, because it's not stopping. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that's a big thing as well. Taking care of yourself, you know, trying as best as you can, especially an entrepreneur, it's like, it's cool because we can run our own schedule and create our own, you know, day and timetable, but it also takes that much more, you know, discipline, discipline right? Be able to do things like that. And like, get, you know, have time to go to the gym and make sure that you're taking care of yourself, make sure that you're getting enough sleep. I am not one of these people that lives by the credo of I'll sleep when I'm dead. Right. I mean, you'll get there just a little bit faster <laughs> if you don't, <laughs> you know, if you don't take care of yourself. I'm definitely part of like the Ariana Huffington sleep revolution crew. Like I know that I do not function well, you know, after a certain point in time, you know, and it's just like, I have got to make sure that I get my rest. I tell people that all the time. They're just like, when do you sleep? You do so much. I'm like, oh, I get my sleep. Right. Because no way in hell I'd be able to do this. And so it's it's really a mix of all of those things and knowing when to say no, shut everything down for yourself and take that self-care day, whether it's just laying at home watching Netflix or, you know, going to an actual spa and getting a massage and getting your nails done, just making sure that you have time for you. And I try to embed that a little bit into every day, especially when the weather's nice. I found myself, I just moved to, um, 
to downtown Newark, New Jersey, and I'm really close to a park. And so for me, it's like always when the sun is getting ready to go down and, you know, it's just like that beautiful pink orange sky. I find myself shutting everything down and literally just going for a walk around the park. That's so great. Even small, get, that's the thing. People think sometimes it has to be a huge thing and it could be something as simple as going for yeah. a walk at sunset or just stopping and sitting and enjoying the sunset, whatever it is. Right, right. Yes. Just taking some time for yourself to kind of shut the brain down a bit. Now, did you grow up in the Midwest or where did you grow up? No, I grew up in Poughkeepsie, New York. I was oh, okay. born in Albany. Um, I've been a New Yorker, um, but progressively gotten closer and closer to the city. So I was born in Albany, New York, uh, moved there when I was like two or three. And my like hometown where I grew up, went through grade school into graduating high school was actually in Poughkeepsie, New York. And then you went to school where? Was that outside of New York? No, I went to um, Iona College okay. in Rochelle, New York, which was in Westchester. So I was just right above the city at that point. So you are a New Yorker. Yeah. <laughs> what would you say were some of the greatest influences for you growing up? Hmm. It's interesting. It depends on what part of my life. It's funny because what I've been doing on my downtime that I create for myself, particularly over the course of the last month, I've been catching up on episodes of A Different World. Mm, I and, saw that you posted about that. Right. And it's so intriguing um, to look at this show that was pretty much the catalyst for me wanting to go to college. Mm -hmm. And so I have influences in that way. I think influences in the arts. I've always been a creative. So I was like an experimental child and you know, I always knew that I wasn't going to work for somebody else. I didn't know what it was going to be. I had no idea that it was going to be anything to do with international travel because I didn't really do too much international travel growing up. It wasn't until I graduated college. Mm -hmm. So I had no idea what it was, but I always envisioned two things, me working for myself and me getting large amounts of money in like one shot. And it being like that, that was how I was getting paid. Um, and, and I just, like I said, I didn't know what it was going to be. And for the longest time I wanted to be like a, an attorney, I want to be an attorney for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I think parts of my family got really gassed off of that. And then when I went into, you know, creative writing and all these things in high school and I was just like, yeah, so I'm going to go to college for math comm. They were just like, what? What are you talking <laughs> about? Exactly. I was, right. I was like, I want to be on TV. Like I got something to say. And, um, that's just pretty much what it's going to be. And I veered towards the creative part of my brain, which is the bigger part. And, you know, you'll still see that in media influence in what I do now, you know, whether it's our web series that I co-executive produce along with Issa Rae on her channel or, you know, just a video is definitely a big part of what No Madness does. And it's because I still love that. I'm one of these people that I did go to school for something that I enjoyed a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so I still implement it in different ways. But I think my influences growing up were like, for school and the continuing education, it was definitely things like A Different World and The Cosby Show and seeing strong, I felt realistic, um, realistically capable images of black people. Mm -hmm. And that was really prominent to me. Um, seeing these women that were beautiful and natural, you know, um, and, and just stunning and living in their mission and, you know, chartering this path. Like I soak that type of stuff up like a sponge. I was really into the whole idea of what like, you know, what family was going to be growing up for me because I came from not one, but eventually two split homes. Mm. And so it was just like, okay, what is this? Like, do I believe in marriage? Like, do I even get this? You know, it was a lot of questioning, um, a very inquisitive child, a very curious child. So I think a lot of my influence was really done through, um, through experimentation, honestly. Did you always have though, this sense of, I know you said you didn't travel a lot when you were younger, but did you always have this sort of wanderlust? Do you think, was there a part of you that imagine traveling in some way? Um, I don't think, I don't think I know when the, I know the exact time when everything flipped the script for me, I was in high school. Mm -hmm. I was, um, I was very much like the involved, I couldn't just be a part of a club. I had to be like on the e-board. So I was very involved with the school. One of the most popular people 
But, and I went to a very, like, it was a very affluent white school is what it was. And I was one of the few black people that were in the school. And I was definitely like, they could put me into that token role for sure. And so I remember going to a house party that one of my friends threw and I was there again, the majority of my friends were, you know, affluent and white because that's what the makeup was in my school district. And I remember going there and overhearing a group, small group talking about how they had just gotten back from studying abroad and they were having a conversation about Western Europe between France and Italy. And I just remember standing there and normally I'm, I'm an extrovert with introverted tendencies, but I'm an extrovert naturally. And so normally I would just kind of engage and these are my people. I grew up with them, whatever. And it was one of the few conversations where I had to shut up Mm -hmm. and just sit back and listen. And I was just fascinated with the stories, the flow of conversation that I made a silent promise to myself in that moment. I was said, one day I'm going to be able to contribute to these conversations. And that's all I said. Interesting. I didn't say I was going to be a world traveler. I didn't say it was none of, of what life is now for me. I said to myself, I said, one day I am going to be able to contribute to these conversations. And I, I firmly believe that it was that party and that conversation I was overhearing that was the inspiration for me to want to travel as soon as I could afford it for myself. I never would have approached my mother. There were opportunities, but I never would have approached my mother to to have, um, for me to study abroad because I knew we couldn't afford it, Mm -hmm. you know? And, and even if for some reason I didn't know that we could afford it, I wouldn't put, I saw that more as a financial burden. And I was way too aware of what my mother's conditions were, you know, raising two children on her own. I would have never approached her with the opportunity. So for me, it was more so like, okay, when you handle your business and you can find a way to do this on your own, then you'll do it. And, and that's pretty much what I did and why I really started traveling after literally right after I graduated college, like six weeks after I graduated, I moved to Paris. You moved to Paris. You knew you got, that's so interesting because like you said, you may not have thought at that time, well, this is an opportunity that I could take an advantage of like these other kids were, but it still planted the seed for the possibility. Right. I knew at that point that I was going to be doing something later on. Mm-hmm. Now my conversations trump all of them. Right. You know, so <laughs> exactly. it's interesting. And now that's what they know me for. It's so funny how things change. Yeah. Um, but that was all it took was not feeling included right. in a conversation and not because they were doing anything. They were just conversing. They didn't make me feel like an outsider in any way. It's mm-hmm. just I knew that I couldn't at that moment in time contribute to anything that they were talking about. And I didn't like that feeling. And I wanted those experiences. Right. So let's talk about the conversations that you're having now. I mean, No Madness Tribe is what, 15,000 members yeah. within the group, yeah. which is humongous. Talk to us about that journey from when you decided to, you didn't even just take a trip to Paris, that move to Paris to the point where you realize, you know what, I have something here and this could be a business. Well, it was a while. Like, so I went to Paris six weeks after graduation and did a filmmaking workshop with the New York Film Academy. So it was really to do my art and to supplement it. And I got a free place to stay because one of my best friends from high school was finishing up her work and study abroad program. She's like, look, we're going to have to share a bed and like everything else. But if you want it, you have a free place to stay in Paris. And I was like, I'm out. I'm there. So yeah. So I, I took it. And It was really like half a summer being out in Paris shooting films um, with that type of backdrop and everything that I learned through the program that was absolutely amazing. And that was the catalyst for me, you know, coming home, going from Paris to Poughkeepsie was just like, you got to be kidding me, (laughs) you know, and all of a sudden I'm having conversations with my mother that you know, I've never had nobody ever told me that like, once you graduate college and go back home, like that all of a sudden, you know, our house becomes, you know, her house and, you know, your room becomes like storage. And it's just like, well, you know, I've had freedom for the last four years. Yeah. Well now you have to play by my rules. You know, you're under my roof. It's like, we went from talking like mother and daughter to having to have like a, a, our first woman to woman Mm. conversation in which we were as blatantly honest with each other as look like, I don't want to be here as much as you don't want me here. I understand that you've gotten comfortable in your space and I've gotten comfortable with freedom. So let's just do what we need to do for the next couple months. I love you nonetheless, but I'm getting out of here as soon as I can, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and it just had to be that real. Those are the conversations that people don't talk about 
that you end up, you know, having, I think if you approach it maturely and directly with your parents, when you go back home and, and the female to female dynamic, I think is very unique as well, Mm -hmm. um, in the household. But so it went from there to me moving to the Bronx a couple months later in a crappy apartment that I only stayed in like two months. Um, and then moving to the place where I ultimately lived um, for the last almost 10 years up until three months ago. And during the 10 years that I was there, you know, I had also ended up living in um, Niigata, Japan for a year and sublet my space. I lived in Thailand um, for a couple months shortly after my stint in Japan was done. Were those and for was, different programs too, or just time spent living elsewhere for the experience um, of it? So Niigata, Japan was, I was teaching English and bar. Went out there for a job and, um, and for the experience, you know, I applied to move to Japan. So I was out there teaching English as an ALT. And then I came home for a couple months and then I got cast on a travel web series and we actually ended up moving to Chiang Mai, Thailand. And the whole premise of that was really to be out for 90 days and find a place to live in a job. The thing is I was backpacking on a visa run between um, Siem Reap, Cambodia and Chiang Mai, Thailand. And I got stung by a mosquito somewhere along the route and I ended up catching dengue fever. Oh, no. So I left that program like a month early after being in and out of the hospital for like two weeks. I was just like, my family was over it. It mm-hmm. was just like time to come home. Right. So I came home, but I came home sick. I came home broke. My boyfriend at the time, our relationship was falling apart now that I was home. And that was kind of like how sway like mm-hmm. I don't get it <laughs> right you know, like I'm home um and I was dealing with things I had never dealt with before I was dealing with reverse culture shock I was dealing with travel withdrawal I was dealing with you know dengue I didn't have anybody in my network that was really could relate to it nobody in my family travels the way that I travel I'm still very much the black sheep in that way um And I just didn't know what to do. And so I needed to find a community and I couldn't find a community at that point in time because none was really, none was really hit in the fix that I needed. I wanted something that was personal. I wanted something that was familial where I could open up and, you know, feel comfortable about asking the question as to why my relationship was falling apart once I was home, but it was fine when I was, you know, living abroad. You know, I wanted something that was interpersonal and that could bring like-minded travelers together. And so in that time frame, I started Nomadness Travel Tribe with a hundred people. And, you know, now we just had our five year birthday and we're fifteen thousand, you know, worldwide. And the growth has been amazing. And I think it was probably it was three months in where we actually had our first trip and I was terrified. I didn't want to do a trip. I just wanted to talk, you know, I just wanted to build this community and talk, but in saying yes to them, we created these experiences around the world. And our first trip was to Bocas del Toro, Panama, which we're going back to actually next month. And, um, and then a couple months later, that first trip ended up in Ebony magazine. Thanks to Tamika, um, who was a member that was on the actual trip. So it was just like, it took off in a way that I didn't imagine. Like I had no bigger vision for Nomadness when I started it. I damn sure didn't know that I was starting a business. I'm kind of like an accidental entrepreneur. Right, right. You were creating the space though that you- I was creating community. Right. That was intentional. Right. Business, not so intentional. Kind of got thrown into that. So- And I I just accepted it. You know, I really accepted the responsibility. And as I saw it move and the engagement and the level of engagement, I was like, all right, okay, something's something's going on here. Something's Mm -hmm. tangible here. And once the opportunity presented itself for me to go on unemployment, um, I, I took it and I was just like, you know, I can sit here and keep trying to run this rat race or I can give this an honest college try and see what happens from here. And, you know, the rest is history. I haven't worked for anybody else in the last five years. Good for you. Now, when you started it, when you say you started building um, the community, did you, how did you go about that? Was it started as like a Facebook community or did you get your website built or that kind of thing just from a tactical standpoint? What did you do to, even though I know you weren't thinking about it as a business at that point, but how did you start? I started with Facebook. Right. Um, and still right now, the majority of the activity is on Facebook. 
you know, we're in the final phase of um, getting ready to release our app. And so things like that are going to be split with different forums. Plus there's just, there's social media outlets that are here now that just weren't out back then, Mm -hmm. you know, it's Mm -hmm. like Instagram wasn't around Twitter, like just was starting to like get going, um, you know, things like that. So it was about starting where I was comfortable starting where my community was back then everything was very like me, 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 Avita oriented. And it was like, I want my own travel show and you know, this, that, and the other. But once I opened up to fostering a community and it wasn't about me, but it was about the the people that I could relate to and the like mindedness, that's when everything took off. That's so powerful. And it is. And, and it was, and it was eye opening for me, you know, it's, it's just keeping it funky. Like I am an A type, personality, New Yorker, Aries, like ruled by the house of self, like, (laughs) and it's not about being selfish, but very much the, um, the real, not the contrived, um, connotation of, but like the real definition of what it is to be self-centered. I'm just very focused when I get into a space and I need to get something done. Mm -hmm. I'm not selfish. I'm actually very selfless. But when I need to zone in, I get very centered on self and figuring out what I have to do in order to make shit happen. And so that's where I was in that realm. I just didn't know that I and answering the call to myself and my problem that I was going to be answering the call to, you know, tens of thousands of people all around the world. You know, I believe it's millions of people all around the world. We just got to get them in the tribe, you know. And so for me that's really where it was all bred from and kind of how, how it grew was taking the, you know, the attention off of myself and putting it on the community. What do you think? Um, talk to us a little bit about the importance of getting started. Cause I think that w- exactly what you did, it was just like, I want to build a community or I want to be able to c- connect with people who are like-minded. I'm going to start in your case here at Facebook, but I know a lot of us, we have this idea or want to build something or have some connection and we just don't take the step to get started, even if it's imperfect. Well, perfection is an illusion, right? Perfection is illusion. It's bullshit. Like perfection, the, the vision of what I had of no madness five years ago is like, yeah, right. If somebody would have told me five years ago that I'd be where I was now and that no madness would have been in like the New York times on MSNBC, your travel, expert correspondent for pix 11 you're in a you're you're friends with slash in a distribution deal with Issa Rae like I'd be like shut up (laughs) stop you know I mean I believe in myself enough to know that I could do it I feel like I could do anything but I wouldn't have seen that five years ago you know what I'm saying so it's kind of just like okay that's interesting you know and so for me it's like you have to just start the, the idea of, of what your perfect is, is going to look a hell of a lot different once you get started. Mm-hmm. You know, imagine if I took a left instead of a right at one point in time, imagine when they wanted to go on the first trip, if I said no and shut it down, you know, imagine if that first hundred people stayed that first hundred people, I would have been none the wiser. But the thing is you have to start because the most valuable thing that I feel like people have and can create in their time on earth is their ideas. And the only difference between people that I think are really successful and everybody else is not just their work ethic, but it's the fact that they don't give up on their ideas and they actually pursue them. Too many people, they, they just brush their ideas off as if they're nothing, you know, or they listen to the white noise as soon as it starts. And they're just like, you know what? I'm a fall back. You know what I'm saying? Like maybe they're right. Mm-hmm. Who knows? And it's like, you have got to be so resolute, even in the confusion, you got to be resolute, even in the, I don't really know what I'm doing. Right. You know, I had an interview the other day and I was just like, they were just like, so when did you know all this stuff? I was just like, you don't understand that I wake up sometimes and I'm just like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> right. But I'm going to figure know, it out. People, it's like, you, right. You know, you just, you have to figure it out along the way and you don't need to be this like super super smart brainiac you know popular person to do it you have just got to start somewhere and I say too you have to be able to do it sorry I was just gonna say I say too another thing I think is a myth you let me know what you think this idea that you have to be fearless I'm like I'm afraid most of the time 
that like when and I shut that down because a lot of people in the tribe like when they post something or you know they'll be like our fearless leader and I'll be like I don't know why y'all say that right. like <laughs> right. stop saying that because first off I'm I don't want y'all walking around here thinking that I'm fearless right because like one it's not true I'm scared all the time if not I think I'm more scared than the average person because I'm not sitting at home thinking about all the stuff I'm doing I'm actually going out and doing, doing it. it right you know what I'm saying like people scare themselves into analysis paralysis mm -hmm. they'll just sit there they won't do anything they freeze and then they get back into their comfort zone I'm terrified all the time because I'm actually out here making these phone calls sending these blind emails you know trying to get partnerships going like I'm actually putting myself out there to see if these things work taking the rejection and keeping it going you know, I hear no way more than I hear yes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true for every entrepreneur, you know, but it just takes those specific yeses that were meant for you to change the game, yes. you know? And so it's not about hearing yes all the time. It's not about, you know, rejection. You, I actually have made it a point. I kind of react. I react the same ways to yeses as I do to no's a bit now. And I think sometimes it freaks people out because they may expect me to like spaz like, oh my God, this is so big. And I'm just like, yo, that's really dope. And then if I hear a no, I'm like, okay, cool. I keep going. And it's just like, people can't really gauge my reaction. And that's actually like a self-preservation tactic. Right. Staying because even. If I shot up to the stratosphere and yes, there are times when I do it South by South lawn at the white house was one of them. It's like, if I shot up every time and then crashed every time I heard no, like you can't control that. Like physically, emotionally, that's going to rip somebody apart, mm -hmm. especially if you know that you're going to hear no more than you're going to hear. Yes. So the key is to really keep them on an even scale where the, the, the yeses don't gas you up too much and the no's never deflate you. Right. Definitely. Now, what would you say has been, um, the key to your growth or why do you think it's been as far as the community um, from 100 to 15,000 over the past few years is, is a big, huge growth. Why do you think there's been such an interest in travel, especially among women and then women of color, which I know it's um, your group is largely women, right? Mm -hmm. 80%. What do you yeah. think that growth is, can be attributed to? Uh, social media. Mm. I, I think that social media, I, I'm not sure that this movement would have been able to be fostered at any other time than now. And the reason why I say that is because I have this theory called the permission of, of the seeing, right? And for me, what that is, is we may not even have to have a conversation or we may not be in a position where we can reach and have a conversation with people that need to hear our message. But if I'm somebody who's hung up on, you know, wanting to go to Pamplona, Spain to go run with the bulls, but all I keep hearing is black people don't do that. Right. You know, like for me to all of a sudden stumble upon no madness tribes, Instagram page or our web series and see a group, a 20 something black people running with the bulls. It's like, wait, wait a second. Wait or a the group now. of uh, 200 plus in Dubai. What was the Dubai right. blackout? Right, past weekend, Dubai Crazy. blackout for Halloween. You know, yeah. shout out to our ambassador, Kena Williams. She's a beast. Like 200 plus tribe members just for the weekend. You know what I'm saying? Like flying to the Middle East just for the weekend, just to explore Dubai for Halloween. You know, to have that, things of that capacity put together. And that's the thing with nomadness. Our growth is being shown even in our experiences, you mm -hmm. know? And so it just completely shatters the myth that we don't do this. The fact that our, our fastest selling and biggest selling trip like clockwork every year is India for Holy um, Festival of Colors. You know, we're the only group of black people in all of Jaipur, India every year. I've been going every year for the last five years. It's just us. Mm. And the thing is, the personal relationships that I have, the fact that I can bring them into the community, you know, and go to the house where we're hosted at, like my boy's family's house in Jaipur, India. You know, the fact that we're going back in 2017 and we're now creating our own No Madness Holy event in which we're going to be inviting people from the community in. Mm. Like, these are things that you can only see and be influenced by. 
you know, and I just think it's one thing to hear people talk about it. And it seems like a pipe dream to folks until they actually see it. So I think the fact that social media is so widespread, it has shrunk the universe, right? <laughs> you know, the world, everything is tangible, but there are multiple mediums in which these things are visible and you can see us doing it. And, you know, no madness, I'm really about owning our narrative. It's us telling our stories Mm -hmm. and that's important to me too. But there's this permission in the seeing that comes along with this as well. Now, one of the things with your group is that it's invitation only, right? Well, what it is set up right now is if you, to get into No Madness Tribe, which is one of the biggest things that everybody wants to know, is you can go to nomadnesstv.com. Mm-hmm. You can go to the website and click on the Newbie Boot Camp tab. And all it is is a video of me explaining how the flow in the group is because what happens is you have people that have been in there since day one. And then if new people get in, it's like redundant newbie-ish questions. Mm-hmm. So we try to nip that in the bud so that you know kind of like baseline how the functionality of the group is. Um, and for those people that are new, it can also be intimidating now coming in on this side of it. And as we grow, it's only going to get bigger and we want them to feel comfortable too, having a bit of a knowledge base. So at this point, it's actually not invite only anymore. You just have to go through the newbie boot camp. Okay, okay. That's good. And then there's, then you'll have, then you have your trips that come up that you let your tribe know about and people can participate if they want to that kind of thing. Right. The, structure? The, buy-ins, the buy-ins happen within the group. Um, I'm not a travel agent. Right. So right. it's like, but what's interesting is we announced in January of this year and actually in a bit of a sentimentality. Um, <laughs> we announced that actually after 2016, we're not doing trips anymore. We're actually pivoting to international pop-up events. So we have like our NMDN travel conference, our biggest party of the year is our anniversary party every year in September in New York City and our annual barbecue. We took over a barn. There was like almost 300 of us just outside of Atlanta this year. Um, We took over a barn and had an amazing barbecue. And so our events are actually extremely popular. The other thing is if you have a trip that only has 15 to say 30 slots open and you're in a group of 15,000 plus, these trips sell out like the speed of light. Mm-hmm. And so it can get frustrating for people, especially if they've tried a couple times and they haven't gotten on. It's like, you know, they get deflated. And so now with us pivoting away from trips and more into these international experiences and events, now our cap isn't, you know, whatever the lodging is. It's really, you know, what's the maximum capacity of the venue that we're doing this in? <laughs> like, That's brilliant. These That's are the brilliant. types of conversations that we're having now. So we have announced, so our first event is actually going to be in Johannesburg, South Africa in February. And then we have another one, as I stated, it's actually going to be a nomadness holy event that we're throwing in Jaipur, India. Now, how important is that? To, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, how important is that to be able to look at your business and be able to say, OK, I need to make a shift, even though this thing is sort of working or this is what we've become known for. We need to make a change in order to be, in your case, more inclusive of more members of the group or having it open to more members of the group and all the other things that this will open up for you. I love it. I mean, for me, I get, you know, again, I'm a creative Aries. Like I get bored when things seems like they're redundant and it's the same thing over and over again. And in five years, we're going to conclude at like just under 30 trips in five years. Like we have hit the world running, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, to be able to do that and bring so many people around the world in such a short period of time. So that's the beautiful part of it. But for me, I'm always about innovation. Like, honestly, my to-do list for Nomadness, I haven't even hit a quarter of it. Mm-hmm. It's like if I was to do one new thing that's on that list, I'd have stuff for us every year for the next 10 years. You right. know what I'm saying? So it's like I'm constantly, Nomadness is constantly going to evolve. It's going to evolve not just as a business and as the movement evolves, but it's also going to evolve as I evolve. You know, like on a personal note, I tell people all the time, I'm just like, you guys are going to know when I'm pregnant. Because I'm going to come out with a baby line of no madness merchandise out of nowhere. And y'all are going to be like, wait a second. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like, all related. <laughs> you know what I'm mean? Exactly. And for me, that that's the freedom and the beauty that comes back to the first question about when you fall in love with entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. You know, when you realize that it's malleable because right. you have control over it. You know, I don't have to, you know, I know that when I get knocked up, I'm not going to have to worry about losing my job. You know, Mm -hmm. if I want to take an extended leave of absence or I know that I could be sitting here having this, you know, this podcast meeting with you while breastfeeding. Right. Right. It's it's that freedom 
of just life, you know, being able to live and allow something to be shaped around you instead of you being shaped around it, which is the case for most people that work nine to fives, Mm -hmm. you know, um, it's that level of freedom and the company is going to change as I, as I change, you know, another big thing that's happening, this is actually on my to-do list and a part of a big part of what I have to do today is there's also the part that like my brand as Avita Robinson is growing in tandem with no madness at this point. So there's projects that I'm doing, you know, like we came out with black NMDN black box, which is our travel course that's online that people can buy into that breaks down all the psychological, financial, and physical barriers to travel. You know, literally the first class, we talk about the fear of flying. It's so you funny. Know, like, that was my absolute next down. That was my absolute next question. I wish I could show you here. It literally is. I see that you also offer co- courses. Yeah. And what is the plan? Which is very smart. I wanted to ask you about that. So that's great. Continue. Right. So black box is just like, you know, we're breaking down the fear of flying, the fear of the language barrier, you know, fear of food, all these things. We were like, what stops people from traveling? Let's start mm-hmm. at ground zero. And then we're getting as deep into, you know, what are the affordable sites that we go to? What's the shared economy look like as far as lodging to how to uncover affordable travel? What do our relationships look like? You know, when we're abroad, living abroad and traveling abroad, what is travel 911? What is like a a really dope, small emergency kit packet? What are the five things that I need in here just to have on me in case anything happens? Like we're getting all the way from the very basics into the guts of things that we've learned through no madness. And so I think NMDN black box is really dope in that nobody's left out. You don't need to be a tribe member to have it. And you don't need to be an avid traveler. You can be starting from square one where you haven't even gotten your passport yet. And you just want to get into the knowledge base of what it's like to be an international traveler. There's something in there for everybody, you know? And then on a personal level, I have face your brand. What's it called? Like face your face brand. Your brand. It, literally you can sign up for the newsletter now at faceyourbrand.com. Okay. And essentially what face your brand is, is when I started no madness, like there was no, core slash person that was really talking to the reality of what it takes to be the face of your own brand. It's one thing to have a company that has a logo that has a life of its own and you take a back seat to it. Right. And nobody really knows who the CEO is. This is how a lot of major companies, you know, have been built in the past. Nobody knows who the CEO is, the CFO, whoever, whatever. It's all about the brand and the brand is this living, breathing entity as it should be. But it is a whole other animal, especially in the social media age and the reality TV age. Everybody wants to know who you are and they want to know why you're doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Why should I trust you? What's your motivation for this? And the thing is, especially when you're building a brand that is community based, you, you know, when everything is good, you have the praise of, you know, 15,000 people. When everything's bad, it feels like you have the wrath of like 15 million. It's like, where the hell did all of you, you know, come from? Right. a flux and there is a specific set of skills that you learn and a specific set of problems that come up when you take the step of bravery to me. I just think it's courageous as hell to come out from jump as the face of your brand. You're putting yourself on center stage to be able to take the praise and to become the punching bag. Right. And so there is just, nobody was telling that story to me. You know, and so I want to be the entrepreneur that comes out raw, rugged with what that actually feels like, you know, what that actually does. What are some skills and coping mechanisms that I've come up with to be able to help people and guide them through that or guide them through making this decision on if they even want to become the face of their brand? Right. That's another thing, too. It's not for everybody. I know people who have successful brands that it's just like, I've had people tell me straight up, I don't want anybody to know that I run this company. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting here like, wow, I don't even know how that works. Right. It's a decision like, either way. There's different types of entrepreneurs out here. You know, we're not all monolithic. So it's like, there are some people that want to be in the forefront that are cool with it. And then there's some that aren't. But I think in the social media age, in the age of immediacy, of Snapchat, of YouTube, you know, personalities that are becoming famous and, you know, and rich, we are more in a, we're in a culture that leans more towards you having to be out in the forefront than not. 
Mm-hmm. And I just think that I, I want to be able to speak to that. And frankly, I want to be able to help people because my ride was bumpy as hell for a while. And I would have appreciated some help. <laughs> like, yeah. No, that's great. And that's another thing that a lot of us um, do once you go through either, whether it's a certain career or a certain experience with building your business, a lot of us create the resource that we wish we had when we first started out. It's sort right. of like, I wish I had this. This would have helped me a lot along the way to avoid some of those moments of being a punching bag. By the way, I can tell you're a writer. That's such a good punching bag. The praise, taking the praise and being the punching bag, going yeah. back and forth. That's an excellent blurb. I love Thanks. that. Um, also, I wanted to um, ask you to clarify rather. So faceyourbrand.com. And then what's the information for people if they want to find out more about the black box courses? Yes. It's NMDN, like it's short for no madness in our conference and stuff, nmdnblackbox.com. Okay, great. So I'll have links to everything, but in case anyone's listening and wants to hear about that, that's great. I love all the expansion and the different ways. As you said, you're growing as a person, the business is growing, and you're looking at different ways to sort of reshape all of that. Yep. Yeah. Love it. Now, a couple that's other good. questions. This has been great. As a woman, what would you say entrepreneurship has taught you about yourself? Mm, that I'm way more resilient than I thought I was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think just I have a sense of resilience and, and, it, and it's OK to piss people off. You know, like I was I was a super people pleaser even before no madness and entrepreneurship. You know, that's where my anxiety came from. I was where I had nothing left for myself. And I think say, understanding that it's OK to say no and take care of yourself and be a woman like for me. My personal, the, the, I don't want to feed into it by saying the struggle, but the compromise that I've had to have, you know, especially the first couple of years of building my business was like, you know, I, I really compromised getting into any really serious relationships and I'm a romantic, you mm-hmm. know, I love love. And so I had a 60 second pitch, really the first like three, almost three and a half years of building nomadness about why I couldn't be in a relationship. Like I was shooting them down. Right. And then I woke up one day and I was just like, wow, like I want a relationship now. Oh my God, I have baby fever. Like, what is this? Mm -hmm. And why is it like an actual feeling? Like, I thought this was like an emotional thing we kind of go in and out of. Um, So I started to just evolve. And I think understanding that it's okay to change, um, that's scared for me because I'm so, I, I live life with such conviction. So it's like, this is how I feel, you know? And to ease up on myself and be compassionate with myself and understanding that I will change my mind and that's okay too. My business is going to change and that's okay too. And you know, if there's a month where I want to spend a little bit more attention on face your brand and what I'm doing on my own, that it's okay. No madness isn't going to die because of it. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, yeah, it's a bunch of those things, but I think right now it's about, it's definitely the resilience, but it's also about the balance between Evie, which everybody knows me as in tribe and Avita. You know, like Mm -hmm. really balancing between the two women and making sure that both are being fulfilled by one another and feeding, feeding one another at the same time through the choices that I make in my life. Because I'm definitely the last, particularly the last two years, I'd say I put as much work towards my personal life as I have towards my business. I love it. Because I really, I want to be in a relationship. You know, I want a family. And so I have to work for it like I do for everything else, you know, make sure that I'm in a space where I am attracting what it is that I'm really looking for, but making sure that I'm not asking for something that I can't provide myself. So, you know, I've been doing a lot of self-work, a lot of self-work. I love that. I'm so happy for you. It's wonderful when we get to that to that point where we decide, you know what, this is something that I want to add to my life as well as the business. Yeah. It's not just about business. Excellent. Now in closing, um, if you think over your life and career and you had the chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be? And what would you say? Wow. That's a deep question. Hmm. And, and if you would have asked me this, I don't know, six or seven years ago, there's no way in hell I would have said this person, but Mm. I'm going to anyway. Um, my dad and we've had a rough ride. (laughs) Mm -hmm. We have had a rough ride and 
even through that ride, it's just like, he's been an amazing, amazing individual. And he's one of the first family members that got no madness. I think he got no madness. He got why, why it was important. And he got the, the magnitude with which it was important to me. And so as our relationship started to heal itself, essentially is what it did. Um, He's probably been the most present family member at no madness stuff. And he doesn't even live in the same state as me. You know, he walked in, surprised me and my sister in September at the conference that we had this year, had no idea that he drove all the way up from South Carolina and he's been there. You know, we had an unfortunate accident um, last January with some of our members in, in Panama in which um, two of my members actually died. Mm. And one of the funerals was in the same town that my father lives in. And after the funeral, he was like, look, whoever you want to come back to the house, bring them back to the house. I got you guys some alcohol. I got you some food. And he opened up his home in a way that I know a lot of my other family members, they wouldn't have. And so my dad has actually really been, he's a big entrepreneurial influence in, in my life for sure. So I would, I would say my dad. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. So tell us, how can we support you? What are some of the things that, some, uh, websites, social media, I have, I'll have links to all the new things that you mentioned here, what it, but tell people how to support you. Yeah. So across the board, everything No Madness Tribe, our social media is consistent across the board on every platform. Um, it's at No Madness Tribe. You can find us on IG. You can find us on Twitter, Snapchat, everything. And, you know, you can watch us kind of like go around the world. For those that are interested in kind of like what our trip experiences have been like around the world, you can go to Issa Ray's YouTube page and just search the No Madness Project. We have two seasons of our web series that's up on her YouTube channel. And shout out to her and Insecure and HBO. Issa's like killing it right now. Right. <laughs> so proud of her. So, so proud of Issa. Um, in addition, if you are interested in some of the things that I have going on personally, my social media across the board is at Evie Robbie, E-V-I-E-R-O-B-B-I-E. Um, and that's faceyourbrand.com uh, for the sign up for anybody that's into branding in that way. Again, the course on travel is nmdnblackbox.com. And if you're looking to get into the tribe, it's nomadnesstv.com. And you can jump on in. <laughs> <laughs> Jump on in and get your feet wet and literally get entered into the preeminent, just like amazing network that is No Madness Travel Tribe. It is amazing. And you're amazing. Thank you so Thank much you for how you shared here today. I really appreciate it beyond just about business and growing your business, but just the personal part of the journey too, as an entrepreneur and as your growth as a woman. No, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. So before you go, a last parting piece of advice from you to our listeners. Just start. Just start. Just start. Get over the idea of perfection. It's never going to be perfect ever. Just start. Just start. I love that. Evita, thank you so much. Hold on just one second. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that episode. And the challenge for you is to take at least one thing. You can always do more than one thing, but take at least one thing and incorporate that into your business today take action today. Also, be sure to go to supportissexypodcast.com to get more information about this episode and to see previous interviews that I've done with other fantastic women entrepreneurs. And while you're there, be sure to go to the free resources button so you can see what kind of resources I'm offering to you guys. Right now, it is a three-part audio training on how to make brave decisions. The decision to do something is sometimes scarier than even the actual doing. So, Go to supportissexypodcast.com, go to the top, click free resources, and download that free audio training. All right, so thank you so much again for listening. Until next time, you know what to do. Go out there and create something sexy, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.